This Twin Peaks Conversations episode has been a long time coming. As we'll discuss at length, John Bernardi and I have interacted online for many years, but aside from a big group podcast panel last summer, I don't think we've ever spoken directly before. A thoughtful, good-humored, and deeply analytical commentator on the show that captured him when he was still a kid, John took his time over several decades getting to know the series on his own before joining the wider community of fans around the time that Showtime announced that Twin Peaks would return. We first came across one another's perspectives, writing feedback to the Sparkwood 21 podcast in 2015, one of the few spoiler casts on the original series, which is a mantle that John himself has finally taken up by starting his own podcast, The Blue Rose Task Force, which considers each episode of all three seasons in light of the whole series. A surprisingly rare perspective. Most episode-by-episode Twin Peaks podcasts, including my own, avoid discussing upcoming material, Many even include a first-time viewer in the discussion itself. The first part of our conversation will focus on this project and especially John's essay, recently read in full on his podcast, called Navigating Between Two Worlds. It's a rich, dense exploration of the reality-illusion polarity in the third season. One more duality to consider in a story full of dualities. The second part of our conversation, as always, will be reserved for the $5 a month tier on patreon.com slash lostinthemovies. It's longer than the first part, and it continues the discussion of navigating between two worlds, but it also offers a journey through the many eras and many eras of the Twin Peaks fandom from 1990 to today. John has been one of the most lucid and knowledgeable chroniclers of the fan community, listening to dozens, if not hundreds, of different podcasts, and sharing them with his own readers and, now, listeners. We even get to chat about Twin Peaks Evangelion, whose hosts were my previous guests on this podcast. But before we get to any of that... Here's what I've been up to lately. Lostinthemovies.com has been quite busy since the last Twin Peaks Conversations update. I paused the Lost in Twin Peaks podcast before the finale, but I finally began a new written series, or rather an extensively revised reboot of a project that originated in 2017, before the third season. This is the Twin Peaks character series, which I've been previewing on Patreon for months. It publishes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. In January, I offered an intro, four prefaces covering roundups of minor characters, bonus entries on some important characters with less than 10 minutes of screen time, and then I kicked off the official entries on characters ranked by screen time, in this case number 86 through 78, uh, into this week. That's the most recent one that went up. Some of these entries are entirely new, some have been updated to reflect Season 3 in the Final Dossier book, and others on characters whose arcs concluded in the original series are simply links to the pieces written five years ago. I continued to share the advanced entries with the dollar a month tier on Patreon as well, this time on characters ranked number 62, 60, 59, 55, 54, and 52. Also on that Patreon tier, I offered a holiday special podcast on the classic Billy Wilder comedy The Apartment, as well as shorter capsules on 60s Christmas specials. My podcast for January has been delayed, as was this Twin Peaks conversation, so expect another episode should be up in February. But that main podcast will be coming out soon, with many capsules and a couple full reviews on 2010s and 1950s films to conclude my Decades project, as well as my last full-on listener feedback section, which I just put out a last call for on Patreon. On my public podcast feeds, I kicked off several months of the Lynch first topics on Twin Peaks Cinema, comparing David Lynch's films to Twin Peaks, starting with a long episode on Mulholland Drive. A new season of the Lost in the Movies podcast explored the Sofia Coppola film Marie Antoinette, and then also, just recently, the Laurie Anderson film Heart of a Dog. And on my site, I wrote the last entry for a while, and possibly period, in my Unseen series, exploring popular films I've never seen before. In this case, it was Scott Pilgrim vs. The World for the year 2010. I also updated or added some new pages to my site, Uh, my archive uh, chapters. I added a new one, chapter 41, called Podcast Immersion. This is covering April to December 2022. So I have chapters for each little era of my uh, site where I organize all of the things that I've written, a description, little picture on a list. So you can check that out. I also have an archive for the year 2022 And then also I updated my picture gallery page and my top post page. Sort of self-explanatory. The top post obviously is highlights of my work from the past 15 years. And the picture gallery page uh, is, is just really striking images that I've used on my site. And if you click on any of them, it'll take you to the post where I use that. So check out those as well. I also provided a status update to conclude the year, explaining how I'd be prioritizing or deprioritizing various goals, especially the Journey Through Twin Peaks videos, which I should start working again on soon. 
So 2023 is going to be a big year for me, a climax for much of my work on Twin Peaks. The context in which that work unfolded over the past decade is part of the discussion that John Bernardi and I wanted to have. It's been quite a period for the fandom. First, though, let's hear about what he's up to now. So here I am with John Bernardi. You now have this podcast, Blue Rose Task Force, where you go episode by episode, and it's a spoiler podcast, so you can actually discuss season three when discussing the pilot, whatever. Mm -hmm. Anything's fair game. So can you talk about that a little bit and uh, how you would introduce it to people, what what kind of the concept behind it is, Mm -hmm. and where it's at right now in this process? Okay. Uh, Well, currently, I'm in the middle of... um prep for episode 23, which is the one where Josie dies, I've been slowly but surely going in chronological order of release through every element of official Twin Peaks. I started with the pilot, um, made it all the way through season one, put in the diary there, put in the Diane tapes, uh, did season two, and, you know, I'm going to stop at episode 27 and do the, uh, I, I'm going to try to do the trading cards if there's uh, enough meat on the bone. Uh, then the the two books, the, the Cooper book, the Access Guide, and then, you know, finish off with what would have originally aired as the two-hour movie, episodes 28 and 29, and so on and so forth all the way down. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do Secret History, I'll do Final Dossier at the end, you know, all that stuff. I think in general, like... The thing that's been missing, I mean, I've I've listened to a ton of Twin Peaks podcast as we've uh, discussed already, but um, like, you know, there, there's there's still this kind of missing thing where I don't think you can really get into like deep theory discussion of Twin Peaks without talking about the whole thing at once. And there aren't too many podcasts who will do that in an episode by episode way. So like basically my show is for rewatchers. You know, I'm not trying to introduce people to the show. I mean, there's a ton of podcasts that are doing that very well. I don't need to walk down that well-worn path, uh, especially if I've got, you know, all my 25YL writing and everything else already in my head. I kind of connect the dots naturally with everything. And I think, I think there's enough of us out there that, um, would like to do that with their podcast that i mean i i'd be an idiot not to try to do that so far so good it's been working out pretty well as far as i can tell you also have a uh, side episodes here and there you know you had um, mm-hmm. l the sometime co-host to come yeah. on to discuss psychology and twin peaks and cinema and uh, and then recently you had one where you read your whole series of essays your cycle of essays mm-hmm. Uh, navigating between two worlds, which you, I think it's like a two hour, 20 minute episode where you're just reading yeah. through the whole thing. So it's like a, basically mm-hmm. an audio book, essentially. Yeah. Of the, yeah. That of thing that was theory. supposed to be a Christmas present for everybody. It was supposed to come out on December 25th, but you know, technical difficulties mm-hmm. being what they are, you know, sometimes the episodes come out a little late. <laughs> so what, in, in terms of structuring the podcast, what, what do you, like, do you have particular times you choose where you want to go off onto a little tangent and, and bring that before going back to the episodic format or what kind of guides that process for you? Do you mean like with the psychology in Twin Peaks, that kind of thing with L, or do you mean like within the episodes? Oh no. I mean, yeah. Separate episodes, like standalone episodes. Although yeah. I suppose within episodes as well, where you depart from the, cause you have a sort of a structure, which I certainly do as well a structure you follow for like the episodic uh, yeah. rewatch but then also you know you'll go on tangents and things mm-hmm. like that but but so that as well as um taking a pause a breather and being like now we're going to discuss this topic before we go back to the episodes yeah um well the um the the two episodes of tangents with l um I mean, I I was supposed to have a co-host on this one, Elle Holgate. uh, She's over in the London area. And um, it was um, it was working out where we actually had the ability to record with each other during this um, narrow bandwidth of my time, like early in the morning for me. I love the way that she thinks about things. I love that, um, you know, it's like we line up with a lot of uh, fundamental parts of like what makes Twin Peaks great to us. But we come at it from these completely different perspectives. She really filled in a lot of the gaps that I had personally. And um, 
you know, I, I've, I've got my own, <laughs> you know, idea on the mythology, like fairly ingrained in my brain. So like, I, I think between the two of us, it would have been amazing, but you know, I mean, life circumstances, you know, it's like a, a good thing happened for her, but, um, it meant that, you know, I had to go solo and, um, Basically, these tangent episodes are just, you know, for those times when Jupiter and Saturn line up and we're actually able to record together because I want to make sure that people hear what Elle has to say, too, because, I mean, I think it's great. And um, I, I'd be an idiot not to try to get that out, you know, in, in the podcast, especially since, you know, we kind of built the format together. So for the navigating between two worlds one that you did mm -hmm. recently, I guess, is that more of a one off? Do you plan on doing any other kind of readings or or solo side episodes no. as well? No, Christmas week was going to start out with um, me and Ivy talking about all the podcasts. Because oh, she right. There was that. Too. We don't want to forget as, that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, she. Uh, you know, I, I figured, you know, it's like, okay, what can we do to, to give back to the fans around, you know, around the holidays? So, you know, that was supposed to be the first one. And it ended up coming up on um, New Year's Day. At that point, there was no point in like rushing them together. <laughs> you know, it's like if, if they're going to miss the holiday week, you know, it's like, let's just let yeah. them breathe. So, um, you know, it ended up just being a week apart at that point. You do uh, mailbag episodes sometimes as well. Sometimes, but, um, you know, it, it just depends on feedback. And, you know, I, I do enough prep where, like, I can't really um, drum up a lot of, like, uh, social media kind of things. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's like if, if, I, if I finally get on the, on the horn about that and, like, maybe start posting questions again and, like, getting audience feedback that way, um, you know, I'd probably be able to pull off another uh, mailbag episode, but the prep for an episode takes way more and longer, like, you know, the more, more time and energy than like anybody should ever, um, want to think about <laughs> uh -huh. beforehand. So like, that's why mailbag episodes don't really come out too often. I was thinking for Christmas week, we do the looking out to the community and you know just saying thank you to all the podcasts that came before me the other half of the christmas present i would look like completely inward and um you know for folks like you like you you hadn't read navigating between two worlds on i'm mean, bef between worlds on 25yl but i had a really good idea that like there'd be a crowd of those folks who would still want to be able to listen to it so um you know i i just wanted to kind of like give like the inside part of my brain too mm -hmm. and um yeah that's why those two tangent episodes happened so two 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 things i guess on that uh, one is mm -hmm. with that i love that podcast episode and i said this on twitter but uh, the one where you you guys discuss all these different podcasts and mm -hmm. i was fascinated by thinking okay so are they going to play clips from the different <laughs> podcasts how are they going to do it and you just <laughs> you just talked about them and yet each one came off so distinctively like you you had a great ability, both of you, to summon up like the aura of a podcast. Like mm -hmm. so many of these I had never listened to, but I got like a sense of their vibe from that. So that must have been a lot of fun to, <laughs> to oh, do absolutely. that in that form. I mean, I know you'd written stuff like that before, but to actually discuss it with someone and, and get into like the these uh, basically like a smorgasbord of podcasts. Yeah. You know? and describing each one, each hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've always wanted to do that. And, um, you know, because, I mean, it's it's really cool to be able to make a podcast and everything. But, you know, it's like, I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, it comes back to that thing, like, where, like, I didn't have anybody to talk to about Twin Peaks for, you know, decades. And, you know, it's like, I, I just want to say, you know, thanks to anybody who wants to um, actually talk about it with me, even if I'm just listening, you know? Yeah, no, a absolutely. And it's, it's that, that, that interesting blurring line between sort of virtual community, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, the parasocial connection mm -hmm. and then actual genuine social connection where you actually, and I think with Twin Peaks, it's much more so this way because it's, a pretty small community everybody's kind of good spirited about this like mm -hmm. kind of uh ob obscure yet rich deep world that we're into um where you know where it's 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 very 
everybody kind of knows each other to a certain extent. I mean, yeah. it's a little bigger than that, but certainly within different aspects of it, it's like if, if you have a podcast about Twin Peaks, you're <laughs> probably in touch with at least a few other people who you might go on each other's shows and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, it's, 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 uh, I, I thought you did a great job laying out that whole web and, and, and going into it. Um, were there any particular podcasts that you wish you had thrown in or something into the mix or oh, um, the, the one that I knew that I should have included was, um, you know, like, like when we were talking about mashups, you know, like manners and madness being mm. like Jane Austen and David Lynch, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I absolutely flubbed it with, um, with twin peaks evangelion and oh, left yeah. them my out. previous guests on uh, twin oh peaks yeah conversations <laughs> yeah and they're they're great guys and i i really wish that i would have put it in there but um i've i've been avoiding their podcast because i haven't seen the rebuilds ah, and okay. um yeah like e evangelion was um the next thing after twin peaks that really got its hooks into me so like i um like back I, in the 90s you're talking yeah yeah, like the yeah. um the original ADV DVDs um yeah. with with those dubs like um they they put out like a platinum collection of that like a couple of years later that I bought and I ended up buying the uh, the original ADV ones over again because mm -hmm. like they recorded the the dub differently you know it's like that's how uh, that's how in tune <laughs> I was with those things and um yeah like so I I um I haven't been listening to uh, Twin Peaks Evangelion because I don't want to get too spoiled on what's going to happen in that in the rebuilds, um, you know, which I will watch. Which one they day. watch in that podcast. They watch them before they watch the original, just like <laughs> they watch the return before they watch yeah. Twin Peaks. Yeah. So many oh, levels yeah. of nesting uh, <clears throat> yep. concepts there. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But well, just like Twin Peaks, it can survive that kind of like random order nonsense. Yeah. Oh, totally. And now, this is interesting. So similar to your initial approach to Twin Peaks, where it would go, you just kind of go years between seeing certain things like mm -hmm. with the rebuilds, are you waiting for anything particular? You just haven't gotten around to it with all the other stuff or like, yeah, I, when do I you was... think you would probably, especially now that all the fourth one is out? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure because I was waiting for the fourth one to come out. And then just yeah. like Twin Peaks, I figured it's like, well, shit, we're never going to see that one. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then suddenly it shows up like what? Was it 2021 when it showed up? Yeah, I just yeah. saw it. It just came to a theater near me in like oh, December, man. which was great. Only time I've ever gotten to see an Evangelion thing on the big screen. Wow, so that was, that'd be that so, was so cool. cool. <laughs> it man. was great. Yeah, um, I bet. All right. So... Uh, as far as your your other podcast episode goes, mm -hmm. your other recent one, the navigating yeah. between two worlds, I want to spend some time talking about that because that's really the meat of you know the John Bernardi sandwich. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's like that's that's kind of your most in depth dive, and it's a very as I described to you, it's a very dense. Like I had to yeah rewind several times and kind of think about certain things, and it was fascinating to dig into. Uh, I guess. I'll give you now, this is a two hour, 20 minute episode. As I already <laughs> said, I don't know how many pages it comes to as a word document. Oh man. I'm like, going to challenge you. Okay. No, yeah. tell me. Yeah. Before I it, do this. <laughs> it's something, it's something like, um, it, it definitely clears 50 pages. I can't remember if it clears 70. So I'm going to give you now a chance to present me. <laughs> let's say three, let's see if we can do it in three minutes, but let's definitely do it in five. <laughs> a sort of a overview um, of what's going on in that essay, what your concept is. So starting now. <laughs> okay. So I start out by basically trying to explain the, um, oh my God, the, uh, the metaphysical world where the lodges exist and the physical world where the people exist. And um you know, like kind of how that dynamic works. I kind of tie it into how Lynch and Frost are two different people. And, you know, like the story kind of works from their, um, their, their shared synergy, but also their uh, opposing forces and like how they're like, there's like a certain way that energy flows between the physical world and the metaphysical world. And um, that energy flow is like 
the the crux of what happens in Twin Peaks in a way. And, um, you know, things like the Owl Ring, um, things like mirrors, you know, it's like there's all these junction points where, like, you can, like, physically almost, like, reach between these two spots. And, um, you know, they definitely interact with each other. Um, you know, like the time quake thing that I was talking about earlier, you know, just start with that. And then, um, also there's this whole thing where, um, Cooper is inside the red room and he, um, he's essentially looping every time that he comes across, um, Philip Gerard saying, is it future or is it past? So like, there's three different kinds of two, uh, Cooper timelines, in that like he's kind of restarting every time one gives him a bad choose your own adventure ending um and because he's kind of restarting and he's in the lodge but his um his shadow self is in reality like there's all this weird like shoelacing of reality and um uh metaphysical reality that's kind of like tying together and blending together and that kind of explains the weirdness and the tone and like why things don't seem to match up and like why there are uh, arguments like you know oh the the roadhouse you know it's a real place or the roadhouse it's a uh it's the red room you know <laughs> like it, it it explains all of that stuff you know like why um I, I kind of feel like, you know, okay, ominous whoosh is all about like how everything's kind of through, um, you know, Cooper's perspective, he's kind of steering the ship. And I, uh, I kind of feel like I've got a yes and going with John Thorne's book in that way, in that um, Cooper is kind of like, you know, laying out like what these um, lodge spacey sort of timelines are yeah it's like everything's kind of shoelacing together but there's also these three specific bands of cooper's you know time loops and they're time loops to cooper and it seems almost like a time loop to us because we're getting cooper's perspective except that um what we're getting is there's a positive frequency there's a negative frequency and then there's this middle frequency where Cooper is spending most of his time and like he's kind of oscillating in and out from the positive frequency and the negative frequency. Um, it's a spectrum is essentially the sense yeah. I got where the proportions of one or the other is different. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. I, I, is there more you wanted to say with that before I kind of dig into that aspect of it? Because. That, that fascinated me, but, but continue with, the, with yeah. the, the summary, I guess, before I get to that. So Cooper kind of has to go through these, um, these bands, these, uh, these uh, frequency bands, like one at a time, because he's experiencing it like it's a time travel sort of situation almost. Um, you know, he's restarting in each one. So, you know, like he has to go through it linearly to get out the other side. And... Um, I kind of think everybody else in the physical world, because I don't believe it's all a dream. You know, I, I think that's a huge disrespect to every other character um, in this reality. And plus, why would some of these characters be just part of Cooper? You know, it's like Cooper wouldn't even be thinking about these people half the time. So like they're just experiencing it from the physical world. They're dealing with these, um, these frequency bands um, that are like Cooper shaped. But, you know, they can change, you know, like depending on where they are, what they're feeling, um, their their own mental states, you know, it's like if they're feeling crushed, if they're, um, you know, like if, if they're not doing so well and their mental health isn't too hot, they're going to be looking at this negative frequency and being able to fall into it, kind of like what I think Sarah Palmer did. Um, and then, like, if you're looking in the, the positive frequency, if you're finally feeling that after a certain point like you got ed and norma going off into the light where the last time we ever see them um you know there's this big this big ball of sunshine literally above the double r you know the last time we see them so they actually go off into the positive frequency and um you know other folks can you know like the roadhouse randoms that you know aren't doing so hot you know they'll go off into the negative frequency never to be seen again and like season three is all actually 
from the middle frequency that hasn't decided between which and which because like lucy tells the insurance salesman in like part two or whatever do you know which share of truman you want it could make a difference if you don't know which one you want you're gonna still be on camera i kind of feel like cooper like as far as his plot goes he's kind of oscillating between these two and like he doesn't know whether he wants to leave the lodge or go further into the lodge you know, it's like, has he trapped himself in there and unmoored himself in time like uh, Philip Jeffries? Or is he going to be able to actually leave the lodge for good? And, um, you know, we don't know where that is because, you know, one, um, season three is only from the perspective of this middle frequency that hasn't decided. And also, at the very end, the last time we see him is when Laura is whispering to him again. But because the show ends there, I kind of feel like he has made a decision at that point, and we just don't get to see which side he went. There's a bunch of fascinating things about this viewpoint, I guess you could call it, this perspective on season three and how mm -hmm. its story unfolds that, that fascinate me. One is, as you mentioned, there's this punctuation of Laura whispering to Cooper at certain points that seem like mm -hmm. inflection points where it goes in one direction or another. Um, and something else is this idea that there's a new sort of cycle, if that's the right word, you use a different mm -hmm. word, a loop maybe, but uh, which I guess is pretty similar, but uh, that's beginning in literally the end credits of season three, like not mm -hmm. even the final scene, but the end <clears throat> credits kind of launching us. So I love all that. Uh, overall, what's, what's interesting to me a couple things in particular. One is that you're mapping on several points of emphasis that alone could be a way of reading the show, but you layer them on top of each other. So one is to say, you know, characters choosing negative or positive paths. I think that's mm -hmm. sort of easy to understand, but you map that onto the idea of, you know, what you don't call it multiple realities, but it is still kind of that notion of like yeah. alternate existences, maybe parallel in a way, mm -hmm. um, which I have some, mechanical questions about which we'll get to. I'm kind of okay. curious to hear your thoughts on that. But that aspect of using several modes of interpretation at once that you can pull apart from each other, but also mesh uh, across one another so that you're talking about characters making choices within what could be a linear time frame, mm -hmm. but then layering that into an idea of, as a consequence of these choices, they're opening a door to a side path like you said the choose your own mm -hmm. adventure kind of thing where you know that's it's branching off in these different possible directions another thing that's interesting to me about it just from my own vantage point i feel like your way of approaching twin peaks and mythology is um very very different from mine in in certain ways you have an interest in the mechanics of it which i probably don't quite as much. I'm more like thinking not so much like how does it function as like, what does it mean if that makes sense? Yeah. And yet at the same time, the conclusions you come to and some of the revelations that this approach yields, I feel like rhyme very strongly with some of my intuitions or, or ways of viewing it. Like for example, this idea of season three as a vector. I mean, first of all, the, the fact that you use Lynch and Frost, that's another mode of analysis you lay on, let you layer onto this, this kind of meta textual aspect of the two authors and their perspectives. Mm -hmm. So that's something that for me, you know, you see in season three and then you can pull it apart. You can, oscillate the signal more to one direction and you get like a fire walk with me and you can oscillate it sort of to another direction and maybe you get the secret history you know mm -hmm. and then uh, you know how the original series factors into that is interesting too because that was a i see that primarily as a kind of a tug of war i think the pilot's very in sync and then after that i think lynch yeah. and frost so all throughout twin peaks you get this great analogy of like a spectrum with a needle oscillating uh, on mm -hmm. it, you know? And so to use that as the kind of mechanism of the mythology, I, I find very resonant. The way you talk about the branching off of it has made me think about something which, which I've talked to a lot of people about how I, I feel like fire walk, the end of fire walk with me is for me still the end of twin peaks, you know, mm -hmm. even though the characters look younger or whatever. And even though it happens yeah. at the end of this thing, and I've kind of conceptualized in a way, if, if twin peaks is a tree, one branch goes into fire walk with me and it kind of ends there. The other branch, I feel like you could argue goes through the missing pieces and that leads to the return. Sure. 
even though these are ostensibly, you know, part of the same universe or something. If you go the missing pieces route, and I actually think there might be a creative aspect to this as well, where I sometimes suspect based on answers he's given in interviews Mm -hmm. that Frost did not revisit Fire Walk with me, but did, but use the missing pieces and the fact that that came out. And obviously he saw that because that was a new piece of work for him. Yeah. That's his reference point. Whenever he talks about when someone asks about fire walk with me, or they ask about certain things, he Mm kind of takes it to the missing pieces. And if you look at what's in the film, other than the obvious sequence where it's literally a scene from fire walk with me, for the most part, it's all stuff that comes really more from the missing pieces or is also in the, is in the missing pieces and fire walk with me, you know, Jeffries, Judy, um, And the way Judy comes into it, like the monkey Judy aspect, I feel like is, is almost kind of Mm sidelined focus more back on like the Jeffries aspect. So I don't know, there's, there's these interesting kind of uh, shoots of grass popping up, I guess, (laughs) through all of this. And I feel like your, uh, your way of reading it and your sort of guided tour through that very meticulously through all of these different uh, avenues and aspects of that offers a kind of a fascinating uh, roadmap for it, I think. When you talk about what uh, motivates season three or what what kind of births it in a way, let's say, you say a time and a space are dreaming this all up. What, it, what part- and, and again, this is, you know, I've listened to it for the first time, so maybe the answers are mm-hmm. in there, but what do you mean by a time, like what particular time and space are you talking about that, is the author, let's say, of season three. What does it spring out of? You know, as I said, in my conception of the tree branches or whatever, I almost see it as coming through the missing pieces. Like what for you is the the sort of origin point of that particular um, story world, let's say? I know it consists of multiple story worlds, but yeah, like for that particular you... purpose of that statement. Well, um, I mean, that's a log lady quote at Mm -hmm. the end of part 10. But um, as far as like, I kind of think that, you know, Lynch and Frost are both, you know, I mean, they're they're getting up there in age. And um, I think they're at the part of their lives where like they kind of want to impart something, you know, it's like they're not just going to do something to do it. They want to like give a give their their audience something to think about something to chew on and you know mm-hmm. it's like what kind of you know it's i not exactly life lessons or anything but um you know it's like what would they want to impart on their experience it's it's basically all about personal accountability um for for frost especially you know it's like you know go out and vote you know take responsibility like you have the ability to steer this ship you know it's like don't be a passenger be a be a traveler and um you know lynch kind of has this idea about you know transcendental meditation you know that'll that'll um you know that that'll get rid of the the clown suit of um uh depression or but i i can't even remember all his words right now but you know it's like he kind of wants to you know quiet your brain and like give you give you a wider view to to experience the world through so like they're both wanting to do that sort of thing um and you know like that that's kind of their mission right now is to to make things um you know better for people so like i i kind of think that in general like that's you know that that's being fractally represented over and over in season three you know it's like you know don't get trapped on the negative um push through to the positive and grow your light so would it be fair to say that you know you make an analogy to the time and space of 89 branching into part 18 that that's sort of like an in-world process in the narrative of uh, a, a space within the story kind of creating this other space when you talk about season three as a whole, you're thinking of, I suppose, I guess we could call it the real world space and time, the Lynch and Frost and where they are at in this moment in yeah. 2014, 15. As yeah, because they're not the going to care of, about yeah. the continuity. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah. for them, it's less it's less about where is the story point we're jumping off from? The, where is the point in our perspectives, our lives that we're jumping off from, essentially? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's like why why do we want to do more than just hang out at a restaurant? <laughs> right. <laughs> So when you discuss the spectrum or the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of fluctuation between these two polarities, you talk about the color scheme at one point, which I found really fascinating. You know, you, you use mm -hmm. blue to kind of describe what you call the timeline, the kind of the more, I suppose you could say consists the, the more co continuity yeah, they, kind of based reality. Yeah. You can, story. you can say it's the material too. And then the blue is the what you call the lodge world and the spiritual aspect, and purple, of course. Or the the red one is the the lodge. Oh, sorry, yes, kind of right. Stuff. Questions yeah, okay. in a world of blue, yeah, right. So the the red and the blue, I I flipped them, but the red you see is the sort of the spiritual realm, mm -hmm. the lodge world, bleeding into the blue world, the the kind of the human everyday reality world, and then the purple is, of course, the zone between them. And you point out mm -hmm. all these instances in Twin Peaks where you have red and blue and of course purple in a big way in season three. I, I, I don't know that there's that much purple before that, that I can think of in like seasons one or two, but certainly in season three, that's a major color. Yeah. And, you know, mapping that on to this kind of this idea of these, these kind of different energies. One thing I was wondering about in terms of your definitions of it, my sense of it was that you basically connect the lodge energies with the negative polarity and the timeline world, the human world, so forth, with the positive uh, polarity, yeah. which I would kind of, I kind of struggle with personally because I feel like I would say both of those have negative and positive strands yes. within them. But yeah. what was it for you that leads you to more create kind of a one to one? Um, a sense of that at least that was the sense i got of how you were describing it that the lodge yeah. energies are more pulling in the negative direction and the human energies are more pulling in the positive well well think about it this way if you've got a situation in front of you and you're in your world you know like um you, like everything from like a, a car payment to like a medical injury you know it's like you've got to take care of that stuff but if all you're doing is dreaming you're looking away from it you're showing the light of the eyes to it Mm -hmm. So like, um, you know, just from like a human lifespan kind of way, like the energy goes through the material. And if you're trying to go like you, you if you're trying to reverse the polarity and go toward the um, non-material, you're kind of doing it wrong as a human being. And yet at the same time, do you feel that there because because it seems like at at moments there's sort of an indication within this reading that there's mm -hmm. a balance to be found do you feel that uh for the characters in this story there's a certain level of neg negativities for lack of a better word um or maybe that is the best word but there's a certain amount of negative energy that uh is necessary or is helpful or do well, you think in terms of the story, it's more of a dual because it, because it's interesting to me is it's like, mm -hmm. this is a very fluid duality. It's a dual, it's yeah. a polarity. It's a duality. There's two aspects, but there's so many gradients in between them in, yeah, your, no, in your reading of it. It absolutely is. And I know there's a ton of nuance, but like, just as far as like why I decided that that was how I was going to do the polarities in this particular instance. Yeah. Like that's that it, it was that simple. Like it was a black and white sort of an issue. Um, whereas like what I really think is happening is like what you're talking about is kind of like the everybody else besides Cooper uh, kind of thing, like where it's like this sliding scale between them. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of think what's what's generally happening is um, the the material world would be in the... Um, in the middle position and the purple position and then the um the positive and negative frequencies would be on either side and like you're looking for a balance between those and the positive and the negative frequency is kind of being controlled by lodge space in you know twin peaks terms so um like you know it's like the world doesn't give you your intentions it doesn't give you um your choice of whether you're choosing to go through the world in a positive or negative way like that's kind of from your inspiration so yeah i think essentially um like there 
I, I tried to use like blue, purple, red in many different kinds of ways. Like it's never one thing or the other, but like if I have, if I'm ever putting the lodge space side in the negative column, it's because, um, you know, it's like, you're, you're kind of like your, your end goal shouldn't be dream exactly. It should be, you know, like in the world where, you know, your body is. Right. Yeah, because, that makes you sense. Know, you're in it. So, but, but and particularly like, I mean, with Cooper's yeah. struggle, where it's like he's being <clears throat> pulled in these two directions that are almost kind of, yeah, uh, spiritual life and death. Maybe not literal, because mm -hmm. he seems to he seems to have a bit of a nine lives thing going on. But uh, yeah, there's not as much mm -hmm. room for nuance in a way. Or if there is, well, that actually brings up something else I found interesting about this, yeah. and really about the whole idea of positive negative in Lynch in particular mm -hmm. with Lynch, uh, because in one sense, he's calling for like a don't ex like his films to me speak to this idea of you don't exclude or ignore or turn your back on the negative. You kind of face it and incorporate mm -hmm. it and understand that it's part of the whole. And yet there is a sort of a purely bad quote unquote force and I would, uh, I would conceptualize this with, um, with reference to, to Hinduism, which is obviously his, his kind of guiding yeah. spiritual uh, you know, belief system, which is this idea, as I understand it, you know, very casually having kind of read about it and, and, and researched it uh, often in relation to Twin Peaks, is the idea that the the thing that you want to avoid or escape is like a narrowness. It's not a duality opposed of like equal good, mad forces, God and the devil, so forth. It's more of like a, the not understanding the big picture itself is, mm -hmm. is the kind of, you know, the, the, the negative, the shadow world, the, um, the word, the word for it is escape. Oh, well, Maya being trapped in Maya is this idea of being trapped purely in a, a very limited sense of existence and that mm. it's not about escaping that or losing that it's about expanding that yeah. so like the positive yeah. to the negative is almost like a question not of like leaving something behind but of bringing something else in with it if that makes sense yeah um so I, I don't know if there's a question in there, but that was a thought that this <laughs> that this discussion <laughs> spurred. And I almost feel like in a way, Bob is to the extent that he's a purely, you know, evil, malicious force. It's that idea of like narrowing. And I think Martha Nockhamson writes about this beautifully as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like some of this the interpretation is rooted in her in her book, probably particularly Passion of David Lynch, where she talks about uh fire walk with me but also the david lynch swerves or follow-up where she gets into like quantum physics and um the you know vedic scriptures and things like that 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 kind of echo this idea but that the problem with you know what what bob means what he represents is this closing in really in a way of of options and and understandings and a narrowing focus and that Laura's mm -hmm. struggle in the train car, as I understand it. And as I see that moment, which is really the most crucial moment in all of Twin Peaks, it's an under, it's an under, it's a, it's an ability to escape the, you know, the confines of, uh, and I guess in this way, I'm almost flipping your interpretation of material and spiritual positive and negative, but escaping the confines of the material world as, as, evoked literally and figuratively in in the train car with the closed door mm -hmm. and being able to move beyond that i would say through empathy with renette as yeah. her as her companion and, and even perhaps her potential victim in there um and that is that's sort of her her way out there and, and so yeah so anyways uh, the 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 idea of like what's positive and negative what do these energies mean what does the balance between them mean mm -hmm. and lynch is is so fascinating, especially since he's made electricity and electrical currents, you know, more and more like a central, uh, uh, you know, pronounced um, 
I guess, unambiguous part of the mythology, like not mm-hmm. even like, you know, it's ex- explicit is the word I'm looking for. It's like explicit yeah. within the text itself, how important electricity is. It seems like that that concept for you is uh, something that, I mean, certainly with this whole spectrum and the oscillation and all of that mm-hmm. between a positive and negative, that, that that's been something that has uh been a very helpful touchstone for you yeah where did that come in where did that begin for you to become such a powerful organizing metaphor i think um i'm not exactly sure why i decided on electricity nexus at this point um you know it's just such a thing now like i um i just know that um you know electricity you know like all that kind of stuff like it's always just kind of been there and i knew about ronnie rocket um i i don't think i knew about ronnie rocket until like in in the middle of season three potentially but um you know it's like it it just seemed like it was a fixation with uh with lynch and um yeah it just seems like um the way he sees electricity it's it's like you know the the life energy you know it's like it's the it's it's the flow of the energy that what do you call it it doesn't have a value to it you know it's it it just is you know again you know the positive the negative like that's you know what you do with the electricity it has nothing to do with the fact that you know it's just there and you know i feel like the electricity is kind of like you know the life power or something like that i i don't know i mean it's it's just more of a gut instinct um what i feel like it is so we're gonna pause with this uh, in a moment after the next question the patrons on the five dollar month tier can listen to the back half of this podcast you can find that patreon.com slash lost in the movies but uh, before we get there john i want you to tell the listeners where they can find you and your work all its various forms Okay, well, um, most of my writing can be found on uh, 25 years later site.com. And um, you you can find it under the theories section. It's called Electricity Nexus. And um, the, uh, the navigating between worlds is there and full, Um, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff is over there. (laughs) And um, as far as like where I am on social media, I'm at uh, JPB underscore Little Green on Twitter and Instagram. I've got Blue Rose Task Force podcast um, up on Twitter and Instagram and like counter social, like all this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Blue Rose TF pod on Twitter, uh, Blue Rose Task Force on Instagram, and then uh, Blue Rose Task Force podcast on counter social. And um yeah, I, um, I will, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to chat with you there for, you know, whatever, whatever you're interested in talking about. To uh, rewind a little bit, um, mm-hmm. I'd like to talk about how you got into Twin Peaks in the first place uh, in 1990, you know, when you were watching, because you were 10, 11, you were pretty young, right? And we're going to pause there. You can hear the rest of this conversation, the longer part on patreon.com slash lost in the movies. We will continue to discuss some of the ideas in his grand essay on season three, but we're also going to take a step back and look at his whole journey as a fan from being, uh, I think he said 12 years old in 1990, watching the series, piecing, you know, parts that he'd missed together through the nineties and two thousands. And then uh, the evolution of this whole current period i guess you could call it from 2014 when the missing pieces came out and then the series was going to come back through the return of of you know with twin peaks the return and then the years after that and just how this whole uh not just you know the series but the kind of response to it and the way that we all thought about it and engaged with it has evolved so it's a really fascinating conversation i think to have and i hope you enjoy it as much as i enjoyed having it with him so check that out there you can become a patron on patreon.com slash lost in the movies and make sure you check out john's work as well blue rose task force and everything else that he's uh, participated in